Good morning, Mount family. My name is Jason Windsor. I'm one of the student pastors here at the Mount, and I am very excited to be with you this morning. Either that or my seventh cup of coffee is just really kicking in. Um, We're going to go with the first because it sounds a lot better than the second. But either way, I am uh, really excited to be here worshiping with you guys this morning. Before we dig into the scriptures that God has for us today, I want to remind you that August 1st, At four o'clock on this campus, there's not a online or a YouTube option. You'll have to be here. We are going to do our volunteer gathering. And I know we're asking a lot. We're asking you to worship online or in Fredericksburg or here. Go home and then come back to the Stafford campus. But I promise you that it will be worth the time on your Sunday. We're gonna hear from the search committee uh, for the new lead pastor, so we're gonna get informed on that. And over 100 people have visited the Mount just this past month, and that is the best way, if you're visiting, to get connected and see how God is gonna leverage your gifts and abilities for the year to come and how we can serve his family. And for you crafty veterans, I'll just speak for student ministry. I have not been able to get in front of my volunteers for about two years and just talk with them and spend time. And we in student ministry believe that student ministry is very important and we wanna be prepared and we wanna execute our plan and we're gonna use that time for that. So I'm super excited about that. There's a lot of good stuff that will come from it, but you'll have to be here at four o'clock to experience all that. So that's what I would encourage you to mark that on your calendars and make that sacrifice. You will not be disappointed that you did. We'll have a light dinner, we'll meet in here, and then we'll break out to the different volunteer groups. Uh, Now with all of that out of the way, it is our custom in student ministries to pray before we dig in to scripture. So let's go ahead and do that. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you that you have promised to renew our minds. We thank you that you have given us a spirit to interpret that scripture, and you have given us your son to lead us to you. We ask now that this time would be profitable, that we would be changed as a result of reading your scripture, and we would go out into the little communities that you've put us in to be a light that draws people to you. Uh, we ask this by the power of your spirit and your son's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be coming primarily from Job chapter one and two and Philippians chapter four. Uh, So if you wanna get there, if you follow along, go ahead and do that now. But we're gonna start the message today with something far more ominous than three chapters of scripture. Uh, I think most of us have experienced this. Uh, We're having a text conversation, everything seems to be going well. We're making plans, we're sharing information, everything is going good. There's a short pause in the conversation and then maybe three dots if you have an apple, and then this letter shows up on the screen. (laughs) Yes, Uh, if you're in my generation, this is just really awkward and confusing. But if you are in the generation that I serve, this is hostile, this is an act of war. Uh, (laughs) Sending this to somebody in the generation that I serve is, is fighting words. I want, it's not even fighting words, it's fighting letter. Like this is going to precipitate an explosion of what are you sending me? Why are you doing this? For my generation, it's just awkward and terrible because I look at that and it could mean anything from that sounds good, let's do that, to that was the dumbest thing you've ever said. I have no intention of continuing this conversation and our whole relationship right now is in question. <laughs> And it could mean anything in between. And so I'm looking at that going, oh, how in the world do I respond to this? Because there's no context. I need context, more than one letter. I need to know what we're talking about. I need your eye contact. I need your mannerisms. I need your posture to infer what you mean by this letter. And we don't understand how much context we apply to make meaning of things. We rely on our experiences and our environment, both unique and shared, to help us make sense of the world around us. I'll just give you this morning as an example. I know several of you, so I know that you're Crafty Mount veterans. You pulled in the parking lot, you pulled into about the same area that you always park, because you usually park in the same area. You came in the same door that you usually come in, And you knew exactly where the restrooms were. You didn't have to ask anybody where they were. Maybe you got a coffee, maybe you didn't. But you have a routine that you followed, a routine built on a shared experience. You got to your seat, your seat. 
Good, you get the irony. I don't have to explain that. Maybe for some of you, there was someone else in your seat. Right? And so you get up there and you give them a little side eye and they're new, obviously, because they're in your seat. So good job on making the new guy feel uncomfortable this morning. <laughs> and, and so you give them the side eye, you go sit awkwardly close, but a little distant from your seat. And you lean over and you whisper, if you're with your family, we're getting here five minutes earlier next week. And we are taking, we are taking our seat back because you have context. And the worship team came up and you knew what we sound like and you know how we go about doing things. And then those of you that have uh, students in the ministry or have been here and heard me preach before or are my friends, you knew when I walked through that door, you kind of knew what to expect in that too. And you know I'm incapable of speaking longer than 30 minutes and you were like, yes, we're gonna be first in the line at lunch. <laughs> and you were, cause you had all that context, all that shared experience. But for those of you that were new and it's your first time coming here and experiencing this Mount family, you pulled in by that sign and you saw like four parking lots. You were like, what in the world? And then you saw three buildings and 57 doors. You guys realize that, right? There's like 57 ways into this place, right? And if you walk in one and you got kids, you got to go over there. And if you don't, I'm, I'm not unpacking that. But... You walk in and so you find your way and you find your seat and then some weird family side eyes you like you stole their seat or something. <laughs> and, and it's awkward and, and it can be weird because there's no, there's no context. We're building context through shared experience and environment. And next week when you come back, they'll have arrived five minutes early and they'll be in your seat and you'll be side eyeing the people that took their seat back. And it's a great circle of church culture and, it, and it's our shared connection with each other, right? And this plays out in every environment. You know how to behave at weddings because you've been to weddings. You know what's appropriate and what's not. You know how to behave in restaurants because you've been in that context. You know when people aren't behaving in that restaurant because they're ruining your meal and you know they shouldn't do that, right? In your algebra class, on your baseball team, at work, you know there's certain people you can say things to and certain people you cannot say things to. And that is all context. Context affects every area of our life and how we approach Christianity and how we approach scripture is no different. We approach it with shared experiences. We approach it with personal experiences we've had from God, with what people have said, with what pastors have said, with what small groups have said, with what shows or songs have said. I was uh, given a message at a youth group one time, and the message was on angels and demons, which is always a, a teenage favorite. It's always a high school favorite. So I'm going through the scripture, and we're talking about a biblical view of angels and demons, and a kid in the back raises his hand, which I love. This is one of my favorite things about student ministry. They do not care if you are needy deep in a message. They will raise their hands. They will interact with you. And it was one of my favorite things. A kid asked a question. I don't remember what the question was, but it was kind of an odd question. I said, no, it works more like this. We did some scripture. It was good. Another kid, bam, question. We answered the question. Another kid, bam, question. And these are not, I'm, I'm not going to say they were bad questions, but they were like, off the wall questions, like really weird in the context of what we were talking about. And so I asked, just real cool, not trying to call anybody out, I said, where are these coming from? And the kid that asked the third question said, from a show called Supernatural. And I said, oh. And I said, okay, so how many of you would say the majority of what you know about angels and demons came from the show Supernatural? And like 70 or 80% of the room raised their hands. And so at that point, I had to stop and I say, okay, guys, you know, watch what you want to watch, do what you want to do. But a show meant to entertain you might not be the best place to grab the information that constructs your theology. But you and I do it, right? We watch shows that depict God a certain way. We listen to songs that per, uh, show God a certain way. We have our own thoughts that predict God will behave a certain way or that he ought to do something a certain way. And all this comes in and all this context comes in 
And just like our interactions where context matters, we will pull out of Scripture based on what we take into Scripture. We will use that context to construct meaning, and we will pull out based on what is in us. And this creates some rather large misunderstandings. And that's kind of where we're going to start our discussion today. We're going to start at the end in Philippians 4.13 where Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is what he says. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We love verses like this. You know why we love verses like this? You can still use a big font and put that bad boy on a bumper sticker. Right? You can see that three car lengths behind. Fits well on a coffee cup. Fits well on a t-shirt. And we love the message, right? I can do all things. I can accomplish anything because I got a God who loves me and I got a God who is for me and I've got a God who is literally all powerful and he loves me. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a problem, though, with one-verse sermons. I would submit to you the only reason for taking something out of context is so you can slap your own agenda on it, right? In America, we call that news. <laughs> that's, that's what we call that. Take a 48-page something or another, take 11 words out of it, and run it forever in in. In the world, we also call that parenting because every one of our teenagers has taken something we've said out of context and rubbed our faces in it. Parents, did you like it? Then we probably shouldn't do that to our Heavenly Father either because we've got this verse that comes out of a library. That's what you have on your phone and in your laps right now. You literally have a library of 66 books written by some 40 authors over over a thousand years that talks about who God is and what his purpose is and what our purpose is in light of that and who we are. And we have this entire tapestry of scripture. We have all of this to pull from. So I submit to you the only reason that we do one-off verses for sermons is so that we can put what we wish was in there, because this is what we see. When we read that verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, we see God will give me the power and the skill to succeed. That's what you and I see. Don't believe me? Go to the Christian bookstore. There are literally Bibles marketed to athletes with this verse on the front. Literally, right? Again, I'm gonna tread lightly here because it is not my wish to offend you. If scripture offends you, so be it, but it is not my wish to offend you. Amen. I've been to enough sporting events where Christian high schools compete with each other that I've heard the rallying cry. Like I've heard the verse set. One team's over there going, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What are they saying? They're saying, I'm gonna win today because Christ is the strength to make me win. Well, what if both teams say that? Shouldn't that enough tell us that we have not even begun to remotely grasp how this verse should be interpreted, right? In fact, I would contend that this is a very self-serving, manipulative, gospel hijacking interpretation of this verse. And so our goal, we're gonna end here today, but our goal is going to put some context on it. Unless we be accused of taking four verses Instead of one verse and misapplying, we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament in a book called Job, and we're going to stay there for a long time. We're also going to connect some other dots, and then we're going to land back in Philippians chapter 4. So Job chapter 1 starts off with this scene where, where God is in heaven, and all of the angels are with him in heaven, including what Job calls the adversary, which is Satan. Uh, God sees Satan and says, hey, what have you been doing? That's weird, but that's a sermon for another day. Um, he says, what have you been doing? He says, I've been roaming the earth, kind of seeing what I can see. And God points out, have you seen my servant Job? He loves me and he cares about me and he turns away from evil. And Satan is, responds to God with this. Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. 
You have made him prosper in everything that he does. Just look at how rich he is. But reach out and take everything that he has and he will surely curse you to his face. Satan basically says, of course he loves you. You've made him rich. You've given him a lot of stuff. He doesn't love you, God. He loves the life that you've given him. And the second you take that life away, he's gonna curse you. And he's gonna turn his back on you. He doesn't love you. He only loves what you give him. And if you take it away, he'll behave just like I did and he will rebel against you. You see, that's what he's saying, right? He's vindicating his own actions. He's saying, you didn't do what I wanted, so I turned on you. The second you don't do what Job wants, he will turn on you as well. This is what God says to him. All right, you may test him. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but do not harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. So here's the stakes, right? God points out Job. He says, this guy loves me. He turns from evil. Satan says, no, that who you call your best servant is no better than me. And God basically says, all right, bet. Take his stuff away. See if he still loves me. And so Satan does. A messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with the news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their older brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all of your children are dead, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. My friends, that is a bad day. You and I have been tested with tragedy. We've been given diagnosis. We've had bad things happen to us. I won't speak for you, but I will speak to, for myself. I have never experienced that. That is tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. In a mere moment, in a conversation, he loses all of his possession, all of his wealth, and all of his children. I cannot imagine the grief. And he responds in grief. He tears off his clothes, which in this era is a symbol of mourning. He shaves his head. He throws himself on the ground. So he's not callous or unemotional. He is moved by the tragedy that has struck his life. He feels it acutely and is appropriately moved to mourning and sadness. But he is also moved to worship because here's his response. I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Stripped of all of the blessings, Job still chooses to turn from evil and still chooses God, the greatest good that has ever existed. But that's not where the story ends. It's not even close. There's like 40 chapters in this book. We're just going to cover the first two. Chapter two opens again in heaven and again God sitting there with all of the angels in front of him. He sees Satan there and he says, hey, you see Job? With no provocation, Job did nothing wrong. This is from God's mouth. Job did nothing wrong to deserve what happened to him. You incited me against him, you tested him, and he did not turn from me. He basically says, hey, I won. But Satan is not ready to give up yet. Satan says, of course he hasn't turned from you. A man will give up all that he owns in order to save his life. You took his possessions, but they're nothing compared to his life and his health. If we move against his health, he will surely curse you and turn his back on you. So God says, okay, you can touch your hand upon him. You can take his health but you cannot kill him, which should make sense, right? Because the second he kills Job, the test is over. He can't praise God in tragedy if he's dead. 
You have to experience the tragedy. So he says, you can go all the way up to taking his life, but you cannot take his life. So what Satan does is he gives him painful boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And we find Job in this next section sitting on the ground, scraping himself with broken pottery, trying to get relief. Childless, penniless, now in pain. And his wife stands and says, why are you trying to keep this up? Curse God and die. I'm going to tell you, she gets a bad rap. Most people look at that and are like, man, what a terrible woman. I identify far more with Job's wife than I do with Job. When I get in that Chick-fil-A drive through line on Garrisonville Road and it wraps twice around the stinking restaurant and I have to wait 15 minutes for my chicken sandwich, I cry out to God sometimes and I am proud of it. Why are you testing me, Father? I jest, but I jest to put it in perspective. The woman lost all her wealth and all her children too. I identify with that response far more than I identify with Job's response. And here is Job's answer to her. You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. He basically says, hey, God is good, right? God is all powerful. Are we to praise him when we get what we want and then curse him when we don't? Because essentially we're our own gods at that point, right? He's saying, are we supposed to hold God to our standard or does he hold us to his standard? That's what he's saying. He said, if I'm gonna take the blessings from the hand, I'm also going to take the trials from the hand. And this is pervasive throughout scripture. Job teaches us that sometimes bad things happen to people that have done nothing wrong. We like to think sometimes that if I do A, B, and C, God will bless me, but if I'm not getting blessed, I've done something wrong. That's just manipulating an all-powerful creator. This is what Job teaches us. Jesus says from his mouth on the Sermon on the Mount, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. Good things happen to bad people, Bad things happen to good people. And I shouldn't have to explain that any farther because you see that. You experience that in your life. Job teaches us that God is far more glorified when you and I praise him in our tragedy than when we humbly thank him from the top of a podium. He is far more glorified and it far more shows how much we love him when he takes away that stuff or when the world takes away that stuff and we say, I still have God. Not when we're holding up our medal or we've got the new contract from the promotion. He can still be glorified in that. But James tells us, right? Be thankful for these trials. Why be thankful for the trials? Because the trials will test your faith. The trials will show you where you stand in your relationship with God. Do you love God or do you love the things that he can give you? That's what the trials will reveal in you and that knowledge is power because now you know how to move forward with that knowledge, all right? This is in the Sermon on the Mount. This is in James. This is in 1 Peter. This is in Job. It's woven all throughout. So now we can no longer pull Philippians 4 out of context. So now we land on Philippians 4 and see what Paul is actually trying to communicate. We're going to start in verse 10 where he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. He's saying, hey, you've always been concerned with me. You've always loved me, but you had no opportunity to show it before. He's not trying to manipulate them to give them stuff. He's saying you had no opportunity. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. Sounds kind of Jobish there. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry or living in plenty or want. He says, look, I've learned the secret. I know how to glorify God when I'm winning and when I'm at the top of the podium, but I also know how to glorify God when I'm losing and everything has been taken away 
and I've experienced a shipwreck, and I've experienced being bitten by a snake, and there's people trying to kill me, and I'm in prison right now. But I've learned the secret that no matter what happens, I am ready for whatever life throws at me, and the next verse is gonna tell us the secret. But you can't put that on a bumper sticker. All that context doesn't fit on a coffee cup. And in verse 13, he says, I can do all of this through Christ who gives me strength. He says, the secret of being content, the secret of giving God glory in the tragedy is the Holy Spirit. I can do all of this because God will give me the strength to do it. That is a very far cry from how we interpreted that scripture at the beginning of this message. In fact, I struggle to see a way that it could be more different. Instead of self-serving, this is about a release of self. This is about, instead of holding on to the good things that God gives, it's about holding on to the good thing that is God. If you live 120 years, if you live 120 years and each day is worse than the next, you have no joy, you have only misery, but you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, you have an eternity of joy waiting for you. Amen. That's better. Amen. I'm gonna tell you that's better because eternity doesn't end. We have the best thing when we have God and we have the opportunity to glorify him better in tragedy than we do triumph, but you and I will not do it white knuckling, trying to muster up these feelings, right? Because that's our strength. It's our strength that got us in this predicament to begin with. So what does he say? Through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, I can give glory to God in all circumstance. He wrote previously in the letter, he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That's the work he's talking about. When you agreed with God that Jesus is who he said he was, when you agreed with God that you have done wrong and because you have helped corrupt this innocent earth, because you have sinned, we would call it biblically, you stand rightly judged by God. The wages of sin is death, so you would have to pay that. Your spiritual death is on the line because you've done wrong. God, unwilling that this would be the arrangement, sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth, first century Palestine. He walked the earth sinless, was murdered on a cross, was buried, and rose again. He's coming back for those that believe he is who he says he is and has done what he said he's done. That is the good work. When you believe that, that was the good work. You receive the Holy Spirit, that is the good work, and he will bring that to fruition. Not you, you will not bring that to fruition. I will not bring that to fruition. He will bring that to fruition. So ask him for it. Say, God, I don't know if I love you. Be honest, he knows already, right? What are you hiding? God, I don't know if I love you, but I'd like to. Man, that is a prayer. I believe God is begging you to pray that prayer, right? God, help me love you more. That work you started in me, that new nature you gave in me, that new identity you gave me, let's bring that up. Let me love you like Job loved you so that I can give you the glory in the tragedy. So what do we do with this information? Now that we're interpreting this verse correctly, what do we do with it? Well, first and foremost, I'd say we need to be a people that is in the word of God. We need to be a people that is opening our Bibles. Because if I had a camera crew right out there and we were asking everybody as they exited, who thinks scripture's important? I'd say almost everybody would say, I think scripture's important. But if we said, all right, how many seconds a day do you spend in it? we might not have the same conviction with our answer. See, the only reason people can take this junk out of context and slap it on things is because we don't know what the context actually is. Because we're not in the word. We can't call a spade a spade when somebody's trying to sell us junk because we don't know what it is they're trying to sell us. And that sounds really good. I'm gonna tell you, me at the top of the podium sounds a lot better than with me with boils on it, scraping myself with pottery. Guess which one I'm buying if I don't know any better. So we gotta be a people that's in the word. We gotta commit ourselves to knowing scripture. And we got to rely on his strength to do the impossible. Realize that's why a lot of people leave this thing we call the faith, right? 
it doesn't work out for them. I didn't get what I thought I'd get. I tried real hard. I did. I tried real hard and it didn't work out like I thought it would work. Yeah, but it was never about you trying really hard. It was always about you following the Holy Spirit. It was always about you hearing God's call and saying, yes, I will go with you. Pray that prayer. Say, I want to love you. I want to know you. God is a good God. I believe he will answer that prayer because he gave his son to know you. If this stuff kind of confused you because you don't know who Jesus is yet, you haven't said, I agree with God about who he is, that's your step. Don't rest until you settle the question, who is Jesus? Because the answer to that question affects literally every aspect of your life, your purpose, your identity. There is no aspect of your life that is untouched by the answer, who is Jesus? And here's what we do with Philippians 4.13. We pray to a good, loving God that when tragedy hits, we use it as an opportunity to prove our faith and glorify Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for being a good God. We thank You for being patient with us as we navigate these concepts. We thank You for being patient with us as You teach us. As often as we wander, You always take us back, but don't let us take that grace cheaply. Let us respond with that grace with love, Begin the work you've begun in us. Bring it to fruition that we can be a light in our communities, that people can ask the question, with everything that's happening to you, how can you continue to glorify God and give us the opportunity to tell them about our faith? We ask these things by the power of the Holy Spirit in your son's name. Amen.